Spin Sheet Magazine. Um, thank you very much for tuning in. It's great to uh, have you here. Um, it is uh, Friday. It's five o'clock. And that means Spin Sheet Happy Hour, sponsored by our friends at Mount Gay Rum. Um, I, like, I think if you've watched this program before, you know that Mount Gay has been a long time sponsor. I do want to give a shout out um, uh, to our local liquor store here in Annapolis, Eastport Liquors. I got, I ran low, I, I ran out, and um, I bought this behemoth. Uh, 1.75 liter of Mount Gay on sale right now, Eastport Liquors, for just about, I think it was 32 bucks, which is a pretty darn good deal. I think it's normally closer to 40. Um, awesome. So give them a give them a visit. I am drinking a Mount Gay and ginger, and people were asking me about the ginger ale that I prefer. It's not ginger beer, it's ginger ale. Um, but um, I, I, I highly suggest this. It's called Blenheim. Uh, and I think they're out of North Carolina, but you can buy it again here in Eastport at uh, Leeward Market. So here we go. Anyway, let's talk about uh, single-handed sailing emergencies. That's going to be our topic today. And I'm going to bring on our uh, editor extraordinaire, Miss Molly Winans, who's coming on right now. Hey, Char. Hey, Molly. How are you? I always like when you try to speak French a little bit, you know, get back to your uh, French Canadian roots. Yeah. Use the word extraordinaire. Oh, extraordinaire. What do you think? No one calls me that my face usually. Yeah. No. So I had a little, I had a little technical difficulties uh, right before we went live here. I had a, I dropped the iPad on the floor and it made a loud crash and now it, it's not coming on anymore. So I'm going to try to ask my questions from my phone. Just going to win. And so, um, if you see me, and, and it actually, it might be great because I'm usually multitasking too much during these programs and I'm looking down, I'm getting texts from you and I'm looking at my iPad and I'm, I'm looking at Facebook and now I'm not looking at Facebook. I'm just looking at you. I'm just going to look at our guests. I'm just going to just, just try to read these questions from my phone, but um, likely we have a very organized guest on tonight. Um, yeah, returning guest. But, before we get to him, what are you what are you drinking with your new Mount Gay rum? Uh, well, it's it's a Mount Gay and the ginger ale. Oh, just ginger ale. You're drinking them. All right. Well, it's, it's sort of a. It, it, I think to me, it's kind of a dark and stormy stuff. Or you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Ginger beer. <laughs> um, Can you tell what I'm drinking by my fancy glass? It's a mocktail. It's a mocktail. If you're gonna have a mocktail, you got to drink it in a grown up glass. Yep. Look at that. You know, it's just too damn cold to go anywhere. So that just means I'm going to do yoga after the program. So, yeah. Anyway, but so Mount K knows that I do love Mount K rum. And if I were not doing yoga right after the program, I would have a Mount K drink. But. That's awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, um, how about we bring our guest on? Yeah. So we have um, Jeff Halpern coming on tonight and he is a single-handed sailor and he's kind of an expert on single-handing and short-handed sailing. Hello Hi, there. Jeff. Welcome back. <laughs> Thanks for having me. So uh, what, are you, what are you drinking over there in your home office? Something very light. Yeah, <laughs> 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 so. I think you're our first guest ever to have an empty mocktail. <laughs> we well, were sitting waiting for the show to start. It, it, it didn't last that long. <laughs> <laughs> I like you don't even fake it. I like it. It's excellent. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. So, um, so the it, the great news about having Jeff on the program is he's been on this program before, and we know that he has a lot to say. And another thing that's good about him is because he's so organized, and he helped me organize the questions. And I'm going to have trouble reading them from my phone. He could pretty much do the program by himself, but I'm going to try my best to play host. And uh, sure, bye. Are you going to go into the green room? I am. I will uh, be behind the scenes and I'll see you at last call. All right. We'll see you at last call. See you later. <laughs> All right, Jeff. Well, welcome back to the program. It's nice to see you again. I, uh, you know, you and I only usually correspond by email, which is always fun, but, um, but it's good to, good to see your face tonight. And for anyone who was not watching the last time you were on the program, let's start at the beginning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about 
your sailing experience, how, how you came to single-handed sailing and what kind of sailing you do now. So I started sailing in 1961. I was a kid and um, my family got into sailing a year or so later. And um, shortly thereafter, I, I saved up my uh, mad money and, and bought a small 10-foot uh, sailboat. And in, and in those days, mom would drop me at the boat yard and I'd go sailing for the day and she'd pick me up at the end of the day and um, I was single handing. Uh, sometimes I could get a friend along, sometimes I couldn't. It was Long Island Sound, there wasn't a lot of breeze. So a lot of my friends said, you know, this is not, this is not my deal. So um, I, I think I've been a single hander for most of my sailing career. Uh, I think probably it was about 13 or 14, I single handed my father's Vanguard, 32 footer. Um, again, I was supposed to have some people show up and go out and I thought too good a night not to. Um, so, um, so yeah. And then, uh, I did some single handed racing down in Savannah and single handed sailing down in Miami when I was down there. Um, a lot of that was dinghy sailing, but also it was keel boats and slowly but steadily I've moved up into bigger and bigger boats to shorthand, single hand. But I think the, the reality is that a lot of us shorthand all the time. We, we have a, a friend or, or a spouse along and it's just a couple of people on the boat and one of them leaves the deck and the next thing you know, you're single handing. So it's, it's not that rare a thing. Um, I'm, I'm, call involved, it that. I'm involved with chess right now, Chesapeake shorthanded sailing. And we're looking, you know, we, we try to promote safe practices and, and, and single-handed and double-handed racing, single-handed, double-handed cruising. I mean, a lot of people um, with COVID are getting out on the water just as, as a couple rather than inviting friends. And so they're now figuring out, well, how do we handle our boat since we don't have another couple along? And so Chess is there for that as well. Mm -hmm. That's Chess yes. with three S's. <laughs> yeah, when we, um, and, uh, and I know that Sharp has, is going to put up the, uh, the website for that for anyone who's not in the mood to google it we'll get to that we'll get to that eventually we'll get back to chess but okay um, so so i and i did put up today on the website for anyone who wants to read a little bit of what jeff has written your uh, article that you wrote last early last oh, okay. fall about um shorthanded emergencies and being a uh, being prepared in in advance or you know thinking them through before they ever happen so um, you and I um, talked before the show about different emergencies, and we, we thought we'd put them into, I have, I have an ambulance coming by, but um, we'll put them into a couple of tiers, sort of the, the, the since they don't all fit in one box, and so we'll sort of the, the all in the day's work emergencies that happen to everyone who is sailing shorthanded eventually, right? And not necessarily actual emergencies, but right. things you got to prepare for, right? And then the second one would be not so minor event, but also what happened. And then the last one would be like the OMG, like real emergency. So so let's, let's talk about the first tier of emergency, the sort of all in a day's work. And uh, the number one that, that you mentioned where I've your jib sheets coming un untied. Well, I mean, these are things that we all go through on a regular basis. I mean, it just happens. Um, it's what my wife calls mini crises, you know, and, and a lot of these things for people who are have sailed a long time is they're not a crisis at all. But for if you're shorthanded for the first time or single hand first time, it, be it becomes more critical. So things like the jib sheet coming untied or jib sheet fouling on a piece of hardware or any or main sheet fouling on hardware. It's one of these things where you, you just have to buy time. You have to figure out what is the least destructive thing you can do. I mean, sometimes it's just a matter of you tack the boat, fill in on the new tack with the jib sheet on the other side and get the boat settled down um, and then go forward. Um, if, if you have a furler, it might be just getting some time again by furling the jib and, and waiting till you have a moment where there's no traffic around. I mean, because very often when one thing goes wrong, it leads to other things going wrong. You're busy focusing on the fact that jib sheet came untied. And meanwhile, you're heading into a collision with another boat um, or forgetting that you, there's a shoal coming at you. So uh, a lot of these things are about trying to figure out what's the worst that can happen? What is the next thing that's about to happen before you 
jump to what's make, making all the noise and and, and seeming so uh, out of control for the in, in that instant. Um, I think we we put together a list, um, you know, little things that just every time you go sailing, sooner or later it's going to happen. Skirting a jib, um, all of a sudden there's a lot of traffic around you, and you can't necessarily deal with it all in, in, a, in an easy way at the speed and direction you're going. So it's, it's a, again, it's, it's about buying time, figuring out what is the most critical thing you can do. And it may be just stopping the boat, letting the sheets run, let the boat slow down, let the traffic clear out, sheet, sheet yourself back in and, and get going again. Um, and, and even things like going into a dock, people look at that, as, you know, it can be scary if you're shorthanded. And if you don't feel like the situation's right, stop, get yourself out on the water, play around, or get a buoy or something you can fix that you can see and, and practice a few times with, see what the wind conditions are and then, and then you can go, go in and try it again. You know, don't, don't overcommit until you're sure you're, you're comfortable with it. Um, these, these two tips that you're giving right now, I just wanna stop on for a moment just because they are such good tips no matter how many people you have on your boat. Oh. You know, there have been times when I've been on a boat and things are getting tense and things are getting tense. We're not even in a race. Right. But for some reason, people forget like, we don't have to have per perfect sail trim right now. Let's just give it a minute here, right? Like we, we don't have, we don't even, we, we, we might be able to just, you know, laugh and chill out for a minute while we sort the situation, right? And definitely right. turning around and, and going back out and then coming back once you're regrouped into a docking situation, everybody should do that if you're able, right? So I think that's, you know, it, it's about getting to a comfort level. It's also about doing these things, not when you're in a crisis. So figuring out how do you slow your boat down, even if you're downwind, you know, you can bring the main in, over trim the jib and the boat will slow down that buy you a little bit of time to let things cross or feather, or if you're above a beam reach, you know, feathering up and letting the boat just, just slow. Um, get in terms of skirting, you're not racing. You can, you can spin the boat quickly up into the wind, let the jib skirt itself and then fall off as long as your timing is good enough that you get the sheet in, be, you know, before it needs to be skirted again. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, those are those are timing issues. But even there's there's things that you you need to do out there on the water that they're not exactly emergencies, although they may feel like it, like making lunch, going down and using the head, those type of things. And a lot of these things that feel like a lot of pressure when you're by yourself, they're not. If you can just stop, and and there's a way there's ways to stop. You hope to. You, if you're really ambitious, you drop your sails and just, you know, stay out there. But part of that is making sure that you have room to do that, that you're not going to end up in front of a, uh, an oar carrier or, uh, you know, bulk carrier or, uh, or up on a shoal somewhere. You, you take a couple minutes, look around, figure out what the situation is, figure out where, where you can go that is safe to s slow down and park. Um, if you're, in the middle of the bay and there's nobody around you're, you're, you, which does happen you, you know you also can set if you have an autopilot set an autopilot and let the boat steer itself uh, just make sure you're on deck again every so often uh, you know if i'm if i'm down the galley making a sandwich or something i poke my head up out of the hatch look around the horizon every few minutes uh, uh just about the uh, you know the length of time it takes me to get things out of the ice box and onto the cutting board head up head down you know, make my sandwich, head up, head down, and then back in the ice box. Um, it's kind of that turtle thing. So um, I I see that um, Jose Tercios has joined us. Jose is a Spin Sheet Century Club member, and I know because I've read some about his summer. He spent a ton of time working in, on his solo sailing skills this year. As I as I recall, he took a nine-day trip on his own, on his boat, a 33, 34-footer. 30, uh, so maybe um, 
maybe, uh, and he said, <laughs> Hope 2 was definitely my best friend, you said. So anyway, Jose, you and Mark and anyone else who's who's on the program tonight, feel free to put your questions um, into the comments and we will ask them as we go along. Um, so- Jose um, is amazing. I, I almost can't go sailing without seeing Jose out there. It's, it's uh, and, and he's gotten some really great pictures of, of, of my boat. I. I'm usually too busy to remember to grab the cell phone or my camera and say, oh, let me get this. Oh, wait a minute. It's too late. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And Mark says he's the bomb. <laughs> Mark, Mark, we think you are the bomb. And uh, and I see that Julian has joined us, too. So we have some uh, we have some uh, shorthanded sailors on tonight. So um, let's talk a little about um, traffic. Uh, so you know, being, uh, being confined by 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 traffic, can you maybe give a, a story or two of your scary traffic situations and kind of how you think through? I, and I think that is one of the most daunting things for any solo sailor. So, so one of the things is that that when you go into some of these areas, it's there's a lot of traffic, and you and you have to think ahead of time. What are you going to do with that? And sometimes the answer is you don't go there, but. Um, you know, I, I, I always say that it's much easier if you don't do something stupid, but um, <laughs> everything is. <laughs> but but, I, but I've done that, I've done something stupid many times. I, I, I had a, a trip that I single handed over to St. Michael and um, it was one of these things where I pushed the boat out into the creek, never started the engine, ran, you know, raised the mainsail and the spinnaker. And somehow or other, I was able to carry the spinnaker all the way from Annapolis around Eastern Bay up to the, to St. Michael's Harbor, and the sensible thing when I came to the mark near St. Michael's would have been to drop the chute. But it was dead downwind into the harbor, and I thought, how bad could this be? So I started carrying the chute down into the harbor. What I hadn't planned on was the two power boats, one on either side of me, taking pictures, which meant that I couldn't leave the helm. That boat didn't have an autopilot to drop the chute. So finally, it was getting kind of scary. I, I let the, the, the spinnaker flag and basically drop the pole towards the, the, the force day and let the sheet run um, and pulled the main in. So I, I just about stopped there, just slowed down. One of the power boats shot past me and then I did something you never do under spinnaker. I shot up into the wind to buy some time to be able to spin down and then get rid of the chute um because i was running out of harbor so sometimes you have to do something out of the box something you know if you put yourself in a silly situation like that you got to do something different but more often than not you have the time to say to yourself look is that really what i want to do do i really want to put my boat in that kind of situation and i probably wouldn't have done that today that this is quite a i was quite a bit younger then a little bit more careless and it was 28 foot was a big enough boat that that it wasn't the smartest move, especially in that breeze. Uh, hey, Molly, just on that topic, uh, we got a question. Uh, I totally agree. Put that one up, yeah. Sharp. Roger, the question: single-handed kite handling. Do you use a sock or other method for the hoist or douse control? Thanks for for being with us, Roger. So I don't use a sock, um, or or, or I, I use a symmetrical spinnaker. Um, I basically have a problem with the sock. If you send it up and, it, and it's gotten a wrap with the with the control lines, you're cooked. You're single hand. You don't have another crew person there to help you free that. And um, what I tend to do is use the jib as uh, what we used to call spinnaker net or spinnaker. Um, I don't even remember what they called it anymore. But but basically to keep the sail from being able to get a wrap, I keep around the force there. I keep the jib out and, and, and tight. And um, actually, you have a picture of, of, of the boat under under Spinnaker uh, that I sent you earlier, uh, Sharp. Um, yeah, so that's symmetrical Spinnaker in 20 knots of breeze. Um, it, it was a little bit more than probably was sensible to carry it. Um, but um, when it came time to drop it, I I, I eased the jib out so I had so I didn't get a wrap. Um, let the pole go forward to the force day, and um, in, in this case, because it was so much wind, I, I 
I blew the shackle at the force day so the spinnaker was flagging and then dropped, dropped, brought it down the back of the mainsail. And um, if you can get it back to the back of the mainsail, you're able, it's, there's no load on it. It's, it's, it's in the lee of the main and it's just a simple matter then of, of dragging it down into the companionway. Um, jiving the chute, it's about marking the, the, um, the sheets and guys. Uh, and, and I use a twing, which means that you don't have to switch between a, a guy and a she. It's, it's the same line. But it, it, it's about a, a, you know, a sequenced kind of thing. And so I don't particularly like socks. And I don't particularly like asymmetrics for the same reason I don't like socks. It's too easy to get a wrap. Mm -hmm. So t speaking of traffic and spinnakers, I'm going to take you off your script a little bit here. I remember last summer or last fall when they held the um, Naval Academy Sailing Squadrons race to the lighthouses. Oh, yes. And I remember you saying that that spinnaker finish in all that boat traffic, and I was out sailing that day. I wasn't racing. I was out on a sailboat that day, and there was an incredible amount of traffic because it was a gorgeous September day. And I remember it was quite the scenic spinnaker finish, but I remember you saying that it was pretty darn stressful coming in there with yeah. all those bulls. And it was one of the yeah. most exciting things yes. you'd done and maybe not the healthiest exciting way. Can you, can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about how that situation went? Well, uh, first of all, I, 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 it wasn't even exciting. It was scary. Um, there was a lot of boats going for the finish line. And I think I was the only single-handed boat out there. I think there were double-handers in the fleet, but I think I was the only single-hand boat. And I was in the spinnaker class. So the finish was a spinnaker finish on a gorgeous Saturday afternoon. And I got the spinnaker maybe three-quarters of the way up and blew up a block, uh, as it turned out, on the deck, not up the mast. But the spinnaker wouldn't go all the way up and wouldn't go all the way down. And I was trying to decide whether to try to get it down or try to get it up. And I figured I, I, was, I was in pretty good place in the race. I ground it up uh, over what was a, a dead block, on the, basically on the axle of the block. And I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get it back down. And meanwhile, I'm on port tack, roaring through the harbor with boats coming at me on, on beat. You know, charter the charter fleet goes out Saturday or comes in on Saturday, but there were boats coming at me in all directions. So it was kind of a nervous thing. When it came time to drop the chute, I figured if it didn't come down, I'd actually have to anchor um, and pull myself up the mast and blow the halyard shackle on the on the on the spinnaker and drop it in the water. Um, it wasn't my favorite idea, but it was the only one I came up with. Now, it's a lot of the things I'm going to talk about in terms of emergencies is buying time. And that's what that really was about. I mean, it, it probably wasn't the smartest thing that, to grind it up, but I, but with so much traffic around me, I, I couldn't get it down. So the idea would, was to be able to, if I anchored, get out of the traffic flow, basically go up into the cove by where the Naval Academy boatyard is, anchor up in there, and then I'd have time to go up the mast and deal with it, which I didn't know what I was what to expect when I got up there. As it turned out, I was able to free it, and 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 it, and it dropped to the deck normal. So that was that was the good news. A um, little more friction on it than I was used to, but it all came down. So yeah, that was my adventure, um, and, and, a, and a call out to the chess folks. Um, the first three. Uh, single-handed, short-handed boats um, had the best corrected time in the per fleet, and that's over fully crewed boats. So it was pretty serious racing for for a bunch of people pushing uh, boats around short-handed. Uh, we have so, yeah. a really nice picture of you from that race, Sharb. You want to put that picture up, the one that I sent you, just to just of Jeff smiling on his boat. No, the well, one that's. A Closer up of his face. That was at the beginning of the uh, lighthouse. The oh right, yeah, little picture. Yeah. Nope. Nope. No, nope, no, nope. that's not that there. It yeah. is. That's it. I just yeah. just a nice picture of you. We don't get too many good close ups there. We can see see your uh, your harness and everything there. So, uh, and we'll talk about that later. Yeah. That, so that's just, yeah, that was just getting ready. It was at, near the start. I think we were very close to the starting gun at that point. 
Yeah, and that's by Willie Keyworth, by the way, the photographer. Yeah. So um, in the all in a day's work, still a category of emergencies before we shift gears into tier two of emergencies, is there anything else you want to say about, say, docking in unfavorable conditions? Any tips there? Well, a lot of these things are about planning ahead, setting up your dock so that it's so you are able to quickly tie off um, having cheater lines that, that run between your slip and, and the next slip, for example, that you have something you can grab onto and, and, and hold yourself up to windward. Uh, having your lines made up with eyes on them that you can drop on, on your cleat. Now, for a lot of people, the idea of having an eye that you're dropping on your cleat is not considered to be safe long term. A lot of people like to be able to adjust the tension on their lines. And if you're, if you're tied off to the piling, then you can't do that. So for those who who are of that school of thought, then having just a, a light line, a line that's heavy enough to hold the boat, but light enough that it's not your permanent dock line, gives you something you can throw on a cleat, keep the boat from drifting sidewards until you have a chance to get the boat hook and get your, your, your real dock lines out. Um, mm -hmm. And things like that are, are really handy. Practicing coming into the slip under sail, the engine, if you don't have an engine, is always handy to, skill to have. Um, I do it single hand, but I don't advise that. It, most people practice with the crew. That's the best way. Mm -hmm. But you should know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So um, a question just came in and it's kind of long, so I'm just going to read it because I, I sort sure. of feel like it's it's in the ordinary single-handed sailing tips. Um, it came in from Mark Rinaldi. Thanks for joining us, Mark. It says, in Andrew Evans' book on the topic of single-handed sailing, he talks about the benefit of bringing the jib sheet across the cockpit to the windward side. I've personally found this method incredibly useful in heavy traffic. Um, useful on heavy traffic, high wind days when it's critical to have 100% control of the jib sheet. Can you comment on this method? So when I had a boat that had a tiller, um, that's what I did. I, I brought the jib sheet across after each tack. Um, the, the one thing is you, it, there's a, on a small enough boat where you can reach both sides, that's really great because then you can keep tension on it. And 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 it's, it's sort of what you do when you tack. You, you steer with the tiller between your knees and you and you, you have the sheets in, in your hand, and you're able to do that. On a bigger boat with a wheel, you can't, the loads are too high and it becomes cumbersome to do that. So what I end up doing is literally walking across my cockpit. I have the, you know, the uh, winch on, on, on the windward side, I use that for the main sheet when I'm, when I'm single handing. And if I, and I walk across the cockpit to get to the winch on the leeward side for the jib, and so you'll see me walking back and forth. I, you know, um, there was a, uh, uh, what is it? Scuttlebutt had a, had a quote this morning that was, I think somebody like Ralph Waldo Emerson that said, he looks forward to a time when the chicken won't be uh, put up, have to put up with a lot of questions about why he had to cross the road. What was his motives for crossing the road? And, uh, <laughs> my motives for crossing the cockpit are to get to the jib sheet or the main sheet, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Let's let's um let's move to tier two of emergencies, which are we're, we're calling not so minor events. And the first one is hardware blowing up with the sail under load. Well, we just had that one with my spinnaker, That's but true. what ends up happening, depending on what it is, is that you you need to again find some other way to buy time. Now, it may be taking it to a different winch if you've got a spare winch. It may be throwing it on a mooring cleat so you have something to hold the line while you're clearing up the mess. Um, I had um, a, a, one of my winches, the Paul, shattered on the way to a starting line. And um, so I took the halyards across to the other, to a winch on the other side of the boat, you know, led it around the drum once and took it over the other side of the boat. And then once everything settled down, I Tore the winch apart. Threw in, I had spare pawls. Threw threw a spare pawl in there, and and that's what I used for the rest of the race. So it, it was a long race. It was good that I had a spare pawl. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was an Oxford race. Um, but um, it's it's looking at what resources you have available. It may be throwing a snatch block on something. Um, I had a main main sheet block uh, blow up and actually cleat off the main sheet between the cheek of the block and the and the and the uh, the wreckage of the 
of the um, shiv. So in that case, I took a spinnaker sheet and a snatch block, um, put the spinnaker sheet using a sail tie tied to the base of the block that blew up, was able to winch that in really tight. So it took the load off the main sheet and then was able to clear the mess. Um, ended up with a couple uh, temporarily rigged um, uh, snatch blocks just to be able to have a main sheet to get home on. It's what do you have on board? How do you use them? MacGyver or something for the moment. Um, yeah. Keep your fingers away from places that are likely to get jammed. I mean, when I was trying to clear the main sheet, um, one of the difficulties was not getting my hand right up against the shiv so that when it let go, uh, you know, taking the force off it so it wouldn't let go and then not getting my hand into it when it did. So mm -hmm. it's tough. These things happen. It's, but again, it's about buying, buying time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've lost masts um, on boats and you just got to buy time, get an anchor down, um, figure out whether the mast is going to sink you or not, going to put a hole in the boat. Um, mm -hmm. Figure out a way to, if you're going to try to salvage it, get it, you know, winch it on board. And that gets hard when you're by yourself because you think you have to do everything at once. You you, you have to sort of prioritize a sort of a step-by-step -step process of dealing with these things. So mm -hmm. That was one of the points that you made in your article that I posted up on Spinchy today, that article from September. That was one of the points that resonated with me when you said you, you don't have to do it all at once. You can't do it all at once. So okay. you have to what's the number one thing I need to take care of? What's the next thing I need to take care of? And uh, I like I like that that way of thinking. Um, we've got a couple other things you on your list here. Uh, um, sail getting a wrap, sail getting torn. Can you can talk about one of those? So uh, this happens, I think, less than it used to. But I mean, I, I've gotten nailed where I blew out a sail, and the pieces of the sail are are caught like on the spreader tip. So um again it's 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 about figuring out how do you how do you get into multiple places on the boat at once and you can't so then you say well where can what can i do um in the case of the sail cord on the spreader tip i basically had to turn down downwind clear it off the spreader tip and then i was able to turn the boat slowly upwind until i was able to pull it inboard and and drop it to the deck that sail was on a um, hang, it was a hanked on sail. So at least I had the luff of the sail to pull down, even if the leech of it was blowing off the masthead. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's, it's it's really again, it's a it's a sequencing. How do you, what can you do first to make the other things happen more easily? How do you take the the stress off of what's going on? Um, how do you even move around the boat? I mean, when, when I lost the mast, you couldn't even move around the deck. The, the boat motion changes so dramatically that, you, that I ended up having to crawl across the deck to get forward to drop an anchor. Um, and then getting, moving to the rail to be able to get a line around the mast and winch it back aboard the boat. It, the motion was, was tough. Basically, I had to work from the companionway. I couldn't, I couldn't or, or the cockpit. Couldn't, couldn't work from, from the deck because it would have just tossed me over the rail. Yeah, well, speaking of being tossed over the rail, we did just get a question in that, that led me to some things I was gonna ask you toward the end of the program. But since it came in, um, can you pop up that question about the jack line? Thank you for joining us, Andrea. Do you rig a jack line? I was going to ask you about, you know, your harness, your life jacket, right. jack line, and that sort of thing. And, and you, when you were talking about coming across the boat, you and I had to discuss the two different philosophies of, of, um, yeah, of so this is, harnesses and that sort of thing. So if you can address all those questions, uh, that would be helpful. So to begin with, I, I do rig a jack line and I do wear a harness and I do wear a tether. Um, when I'm racing, I'll sometimes have two tethers. Um, but mostly I carry a single tether. There, amongst the, the shorthanded community, there is this debate about whether what, uh, tethers make sense or not. Um, there's an argument that says that life jackets and tethers are something that catch on things and, and, and trip over, and there's a lot of shorthanded sailors that don't use them. I prefer to use them. Um, I use them a little bit differently than a lot of people. I um, a lot of 
the people that come out of the climbing world use a static line that can stretch a little bit for the jack line. And the idea is that if you fall and, and you're on a line that can't stretch, it's going to be really painful when you pull up tight on the line. Um, I use a Kevlar line for that. It has very little stretch. And the idea is I don't want to make it to the rail. So I go down the weather side of the boat as much as I can. Um, and that way, if I lose my balance, I technically, theoretically, won't make it all the way over the rail on the leeward side. And I, I believe in them. I, I had an incident a few winters ago where I was out sailing. And it was a day that was maybe 10 knots of breeze. And my friend Tom Schubert was in Annapolis Harbor. And he points and says, you better get home. I sailed past him on a dock. And I look back and there's a wall of black coming. The sky was just black. And by the time I got to um, Whitehall Bay, which is near home, it was gusting into the high 30s, low 40s. And um, I had gotten the jib furled and had to go on deck to get the mainsail down. Now, I carried sail way too long. I, I was hoping to be able to get into the into the creek before the it caught me. And uh, so, I mean, I was doing a little over 12 knots between uh, the, the yellow mark, Annapolis mark, A mark, and uh, my turn into Whitehall. Um, but now I had to get the mainsail down and I'd gone up on the cabin top to try to pull the mainsail down. And I'd set the boat up where the, I was on the windward side of the boom and the, the sail was coming, I was pushing the sail over to the leeward side of the boom. I was almost dead into the wind, but not quite. And all of a sudden the wind shifted about 45 degrees. So now the sail was full on the other side of the boat, pushing me off the boat. And it literally threw me up in the air. Um, I think part of it was that I missed the side of the, the cabin. I was, since I was on the cabin, I, I was now above the deck, but it threw me forward so that um, in midair, the tether caught and spun me around. And I came down on the foredeck on my feet, um, hit, hit my shoulder on the shrouds as I went past them. And, um, and just dropped to the deck and said, okay, where am I? <laughs> you know, what, did I, what have I just done? But it threw me about the length of the tether and probably would have thrown me further except the tether had caught on a piece of deck hardware and that's and, and didn't slide. So the, the hook had caught on, uh, the hook was on one side of a winch and the, and the t uh, jack line was on the other. So that was all I could go. So I, I believe in lifeline, in um, jack lines and harnesses and tethers. I have some tricks I use, for example, if I, if I have to work and I want to free up my hands, I'll take the the, um, j uh, the tether and I'll wrap it around the um, jack line and, and hook it back into my chest ring. So instead of it being a six foot long jack line, now it's a, a three foot long jack line. So you can't go as, get thrown as far. It's not the same as having one hand holding on and one hand um, doing the task, but if you need two hands, at least you can't fly as far. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm you big. Probably boy. give a whole class on that right there. <laughs> no, that's the end of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the only other piece of that is the reason that I, when I'm cruising, I'll carry, I'll wear two jack lines sometimes. Is that you? There's this moment where you're transferring the one jack line, cutting it, you know, basically folding it in half. The, that you're unhooked from the boat. So by having the second jack line, you can stay hooked on while you fold your one jack line over. And the other thing I'm a big believer in is these, I love these jack lines that have the um, um, shock cord in them and they, they retract so so that you don't have this thing dragging around under your feet. Yeah. Um, um, the tripping thing is, is a serious thing. I mean, it, you do catch your life jacket on things if you wear a harness and life jacket all the time. Uh, you know, I wear an inflatable. I wear one of the um, pressure actuated ones rather than the water actuated one because... All too often, I do get wet. Uh, you know, if you're sailing in rain, you can set off the moisture actuated ones, whereas the hydrostatic ones don't set off. Mm -hmm. um, more sensible would be at the dock on a rainy day. But anyway, that's another story for another day. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you for that little detour. Um, let's go back to some of these uh, emergencies and the not so minor events. Um, a line in the proper rudder. So, um, you always hear how you can't get a line in the rudder of a full keel boat. But the only time I've ever gotten a line in the rudder of a full keel boat 
of a boat. It was a, it was a full keel, an old uh, 1939 stale cutter that I had down in Florida. And the, the I had anchored in a spot that had a lot of current and a, and a lot of wind. And the anchor line had gotten uh, between the uh, rudder and the um, and, and the keel, it's the top of the rudder and, the, and, and the, actually the horn timber is a wooden boat. And I thought I had retrieved the anchor on board, except there was a, a loop of it still wrapped around the back of the boat. And I, I'm, to this day, I'm not, I've never been clear on how I managed to pull that off. I, but, <laughs> um, but once I realized I was trapped with that, it, it, it was, it, we were sailing. I mean, we were under sail and I couldn't turn the rudder past the center line. And um, I was afraid to crank the engine. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, and we ended up anchoring again. Um, and, so, and that's how we realized we, what the problem was, that the, the anchor line went, there was a piece of anchor line running down under the bobstay. It was a bowsprit boat. So we ran on the bobstay back onto the boat and back along the bottom to the, to the rudder. What we ended up doing there was catching that loop of line with a, a boat hook and struggling it around. Um, if I had to do that on, on one of the fin keel boats I've owned, I, I usually carry a kellet, which is a heavy weight that you, that you hang on your anchor line. And a kellet comes in really a lot of use for keeping the boat from kiting around when you're on the anchor, but it's also really good for freeing a line that's, that's running under the boat. So, um, my wife and I had gone up cruising to Gibson Island last fall. We managed to get a line wrapped around a mooring buoy in between the keel and the rudder. And I put the kelet on the line and that took the line down to the bottom and freed it from the keel and the rudder. But that was a big help. And then once freed from there, I was able to free it from the, the mooring buoy. Um, by the time we freed it from the, went to free it from the mooring buoy, we managed to have a single whole wrap around that mooring buoy. So I uh, ended up hooking a, a line to the mooring bu buoy and hauling it up vertically out of the water till it was completely clear of the water. It's a messy proposition. The, the, the chain was a mess, but but that at least allowed me to unwrap my line from around that um, mooring chain, get it up over the top of the buoy and then lower the buoy back in the water and get out of there. Um, not great seamanship getting in that situation but step at a time one piece at a time getting out of it so i've never heard of that um, use of a kellet before i was recently discussing uh kellets with uh, thank you jose kellet is it like a sentinel for anchoring <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's an old what a is for anyone who doesn't use one it's an old school thing it, it, it's 25 pounds of lead or 20 pounds of lead that has a, a shackle on top and you they used to call them line riders and things like that, but you hook it on your anchor line and it pulls the anchor line down closer to the water. For those of us who use some mix of anchor road and chain, it, it keeps the line out of the way where power boats aren't gonna snag it or someone isn't gonna, isn't gonna catch it on their keel. And um, it keeps the boat from swinging around. I, I, I try to set it so that it's dragging on the bottom and that way the boat can't get up speed swinging back and forth in a tight anchorage. Mm -hmm. And um, but I use it for other crazy things, like when I've managed to get an anchor line between my keel and my rudder. So, which that's, that doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Well, I, I recently gave an assignment to uh, anyone who reads the magazine, my, who reads the Blue Water Dreaming column, has read John Herlig's articles before, and he said that he he felt like a. a he could spend an entire evening talking about anchoring and kellets and in. Um, with certain sailors that he could argue all evening about that. And I said, that, that just sounds like there's an article in there somewhere. And he said, he, he said he was going to sleep on that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds uncomfortable yeah. to me, but okay. <laughs> so um, let's see, how about when you're in boat traffic and having trouble making your mark? Yeah, having yeah. Your so that happens. That? Yeah. That happens more than we like. I mean, we're, we're all dialed in, we're sailing. We're going to try to make it around the mark. There's all these boats around us. And again, it's, it's what we started saying at the beginning, which is slow down, figure out whether you ease sails or, 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 or find a way to turn around so that you can buy yourself a clear path. Um, part of it is being ready to do things. You know, when you're shorthanded, 
you almost don't have spare time because especially if you're in traffic because you you need to be you just finish a maneuver you need to be getting the boat set for the next ma maneuver so coiling lines um making sure things are free to run uh making sure you have your lines are where you can get to them. Your winch handles are where you can get to them. I use uh, winch handles that have locks on them, which I know racers don't like, but but if you, but I keep them in the winch. I can keep them in the winch that way, and I don't have to look for the winch handle. It's it's there. Um, but um, the other thing about coiling the line is coiling it in a figure eight, so you don't have uh, a hackle in the line. You know, I think with a uh, pigtail in the line that can get jammed. Um, uh, I do that much more quickly than I can do a, a straight coil anymore. That just I use a end of a winch handle and coil between my hand and, and the winch handle in a figure eight. It takes the twist out of the line. You know, modern line will hold torsion. So unlike the old days where lines they had torsion, but they but it was only in, always in one direction. Modern line with the core, if you twist it, it will hold that twist and and, and more likely to get a jam. So. Mm -hmm. So we have one more one more thing in the in the middle tier that you claim that you are often guilty of, and that is uh, being canvassed and uh, over canvassed and building breeze. Ah, uh, yes, that that is guilty as charged. Um, and and Shar, I, I sent you that picture of, 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 of Synergy heading for the bridge um, under Spinnaker. Yeah, that one. So this was a perfectly nice day to to have a Spinnaker up shorthanded. It was. At that point, I don't know, eight, 10 knots at the most, maybe. And uh, a number of us had, were, were going on a shorthanded uh, uh, race or cruise, I don't even remember anymore, uh, up to the, um, up towards uh, Chester River. So um, uh, Jim, Jim, Hall, Jim Little took this picture and it's, 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 it's a great shot. But um, uh, Sharp, if you put up that picture of the boat with the yellow spinnaker, So about, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes later, not even 10 minutes later, once we were north of the bridge, the wind filled in. So, so this is John Zaleski. He, he's single-handing his 30-foot um, Pearson, Pearson 30. And, and he, he, he took this knockdown. Actually, this is before it got worse. But what was interesting about that afterward, I said, John, what, what, what did you do there? And he said, I basically sat still and waited for it to, the, the gust to, to, to end. And once the gust ended, the boat stood up enough that I could turn down wind and, and, and get rid of the spinnaker. And, and, and it's, it's that kind of sometimes having to wait, be patient when things are getting uh, crazy until you have room to, to, to deal with it. Um, so, sometimes it's a matter of looking for where you can get enough sea room to leave the helm and, 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 and shorten sail and do what you have to do. Um, and um, sometimes it means flag, flagging the main. Sometimes it means, um, well, furling a jib and, and going under one sail until you can reef. Um, I'll, if I have enough sea room, or I don't have enough sea room rather, but, I, but I've got enough room to do this, I'll hove two sometimes and reef the main. Um, but also I have the boat set up so that no matter what wind direction, short of dead downwind and a heavy breeze, I can usually reef the main at almost any point of sail. And uh, with the autopilot, I'll put it on the autopilot and, 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 and do that. So there's a, I'm a big fan of two line reefing, what used to be called slab reefing, where there's a um, tack line and a, and a clue line. And what's nice about that is that, that it's fast, the attack line, and reliable. And the thing about the clue line is, if, if you're in these conditions where it gets to be a lot of wind, then it lightens up, it gets a lot of wind, you can um, round the sail up a little bit, make it a little bit more powerful, or blade it out using the clue line um, to do that. And all that, in my case, I've got it all run back to the cockpit, so it's easy enough to do. Would you like to pop up any any questions? I, the, with my setup right now, I can't seem to go backwards, but I know a couple of them came in. Oh yeah, I can go backwards. You see any questions that we should put up there right now? 
You're gonna make me ask them. Hold on. Uh, well, I feel like there are a number of equipment questions there. Yeah. Well, Andrea also had a good question about whether or not you were an EPIRB, a personal EPIRB. Yeah, a PLB or a personal EPIRB. I I don't. I should. Um, uh, that would be a very sensible thing to do. I do keep a VHF handheld in the cockpit, and it is one that floats. Um, it's too big to stick in my pocket, so I almost don't. I don't carry it around the boat with me. Um, I'm not a great swimmer. I, I, I can barely swim. So life jackets, my, my best friend. Yeah. Uh, I race on a new boat. I always tell him, get back to me quickly. Um, so um, I think there's a lot of equipment that's hitting the market. That's it's really great stuff. I mean, it's, it's it, things that used to be fatal are less so. People are more likely to be recovered. Um, I, I see there, there are these little portable versions that um, they have an A signal on them and things like that um, that allows you to find a person when you, you, you might not have historically. It's amazing how quickly something disappears from sight. Um, I do practice man overboard drills, not, not when I'm alone. Um, and I have a... Um, a antifreeze bottle that has a, a, a parachute on it, you know, the um, uh, sea anchor on it so that it doesn't drift too fast. And it's amazing if you throw that over the side with a crew that's not very experienced and you go, man, overboard, how long it takes to turn the boat around and get back to it. And how often it's not so easy to see. Now that's a bright yellow, you know, it's a Presto, right? It's bright yellow. And yet, Pretty quickly, you're really looking for that thing, even even if there's only small ways. So I don't wear one. I probably should wear one. Uh, they only I cost 300 wear... bucks these days, so they really have become very reasonable on the market. Though I, I should look at that. So we, we, we should put a, put a fund together. Let's let's get Jeff a, a, a PLB or personal EPIRB. So uh, Mark Burroughs asked the top five most important bits of kit or equipment. I kind of feel like you've already touched on them. We just haven't put them in order. I mean, I, I would say that well, you that. Well, so, so the most you're important ones. You're talking about your life and your tether and your jack lines. Like, well, the that's most important be is blood. a boat that can be single handed. I'll, I'll start there. Um, There's a lot of boats that are very hard to sail short handed. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I think it's mainly about how you set, set things up more than anything else. So, so, for example, my, my GPS is on a turntable, so I can see it anywhere in the cockpit. Um, it's mounted on the face of the binnacle, and I can spin it around. Um, so even if, even if I am piloting using a, a paper chart, I still can spin that and check my position. Um, I think, that, sure, the, the whole safety setup of the tether, the, the inflatable harness, uh, jack lines, that, that collection of parts. But it's also a collection of pieces and parts that, that, that are prepared if something goes wrong. It's something like the emergency tiller. It's something like the, and I think I mentioned in the article, having the right wrench to be able to take the nut off the, the wheel so you can get the steering wheel out of the way so you can use the emergency tiller. Uh, at least on my boat, and then a lot of the boats I've been on, you, the, the tiller will actually hit the back of the wheel or it's too short to, to steer with, then you have to have snatch blocks and be able to rig it some way to get enough purchase to steer. So having thought through, what do you do? How do you do it? Having the spare equipment on board. I mean, one of my favorite pieces of kit is, is, is snatch blocks because you can always jury rig something. Uh, a pretty well-equipped toolbox is your best friend, especially if you're on an older boat. Um, Synergy is pretty reliable. I've been replacing and updating over the years, but every once in a while, some 40 year old piece of kit that's maybe 25 years old now has been replaced once decides it, it's, it's retirement time. It, it got its social security check and went home. And so I think tools, spare, spare parts, it just 
and knowing your boat, knowing what parts you, you might end up needing. Um, you know, pole kit, uh, you know, winch, winch repair kit. It's sooner or later you're going to need it. You might as well have it. So, um, I don't know that we're going to get to the, oh my God, this is serious emergencies. But the good news is that the audience has lots of questions. And okay. one of them catches my eye because it gives us a chance to talk about chess. So um, can you put up Mark Rinaldi's question there? How has the pandemic affected chess events? And uh, are there any information about upcoming chess events? Well, so chess was sort of a natural during COVID, um, meaning that you're socially distancing um, if you're single handing and, and, and most people who are double handing are, are double handing with somebody from their household. Um, as soon as the governor lifted the restriction on being out on the water, uh, the chess board, uh, got together and, and planned our first event. And I think we pulled it off in about maybe two, three weeks after the, um, pr prohibition was lifted. We did, um, the Poplar Island race, um, so I think the first event we have this year is what we call our Gathering Gab. It's um, our annual membership meeting. But before that, we're going to have shorthanded race practice, so starting practice. So we'll set up a starting line and do rolling starts so that people can practice getting their boat across the starting line for those who want to race. And for those who don't want to race, there's going to be the Gathering Gab, which is a raft up. It, um, I'm sure, I think, Last year we did it in Mill Creek. I'm not sure what we're going to do it this year. Um, we raft up socially distanced. Uh, the boats were tied up stern in two rows stern to stern. So we had anchors that were 180 degrees apart. And that way the, there was about six, seven feet of water between the sterns of the boats. And most of the boats are wide enough that if everybody sat on the same, you know, also everybody sat on starboard while well, you're, you're 10 feet, 12 feet apart. Um, and that, that was a pretty nice setup so that we could, hold our annual meeting as, and so our, the first event for chess this year is gonna be, I think May 7th is, is the Gathering Gab. And then following that, we have the Poplar Island race, which is again, a shorthanded race to single and double-handed. Um, there's there's spinnaker class and non-spin class. Um, it's, I think about a 15, 20 mile race. And, it, and, and it's, it's interesting as you go around the course either direction. So there's a tactical element, do you wanna, go around clockwise or counterclockwise. We have a number of chess starts with in, in, in other races. I think we're on the calendar for the Oxford races and a few other races this summer. Um, we also have the challenges for those people who aren't races, racers. The challenges are uh, social and cruising events. It's typically they are um, a distance of 20, 25 miles. Some of them are longer. Some of them are over a three-day weekend. So we jump from place to place. And it's about trying out shorthanded skills. And then at the end of, of each leg of those cruises, there's a typically a raft up or last year with COVID, we dingied around and, and socially distanced, but it gave a chance for people to have, uh, to ask questions. And also we keep VHF open. And, and so if somebody wants to do some coaching or something like that. We're, we're tuned into a, a pretty dead channel. We're sharing it maybe with fishermen, but it gives us a chance to talk about how do you do something or, or how's your sail trim look and things like that. So, so for those who are getting into shorthanded sailing, cruising, it's not, those are not races. It gives mm -hmm. them a chance to expand and, and try that. And, and also have people to, who are doing the same thing so they can see how it's done as well. So, um, and, and Jeff, you do such a great job with keeping us uh, posted at Spin Sheet. So for anyone who doesn't read the club notes section of Spin Sheet, start reading it because Jeff sends in updates on what chess is up to and the upcoming social events when it comes to chess. And sometimes they go into racing if they're completely racing oriented, but a lot of times they're a mix. So um, they so we put them into the club notes section of Spin Sheet. And, um, and thank you for that. And, and Jeff, we're- Thank you we for publishing them. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, we we are out of time. It's oh. last fall, so we have we have so much that we didn't cover. So the only thing that we can do is just have you back. Uh oh. <laughs> Would you like to come back? 
All right. Well, all right. So it probably won't be till April since we have our March schedule plans, but you and I can connect and we'll come up with a time for you to come back and we can cover those OMG um, uh, single-handed emergencies. And maybe we can have a just ask Jeff, you know, (laughs) just just bring on some single-handers and say, have at it. Tell us a situation that flummoxed you as a single-hander and, and what, 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 what you could do to prepare for that in the future. I, I, I'd be glad to do that. Molly, one thing I did want to mention about chess, for people who are not single-handers but are thinking they'd like to try single-handing, we have a program we call Solo Plus One in which somebody from the or from the club will get on a boat with a person who's trying to figure out how to single-hand their boat, and, and we'll watch and coach. It gives you a chance to have another person along. Very often with, with shorthanded sailing, it's it's the choreography. How do you move around the cockpit? How do you do things? It's not necessarily about modifying the boat. And with that in mind, um, you know, the solo plus one is great because someone can say, well, now if you stood over here instead of where you're used to sa- standing, you might be able to do that more easily. So mm-hmm. just throw that out as an, another thing. Good. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you for Hello. being our guest. Darby, you want to come back? Come back. There you are. Well, anyway, um, cheers to you, Jeff. With your, um, you're a great, you're a great guest. You have, <laughs> you're all. The, well, my favorite mocktail guy was the one who was drinking his ginger ale out of a boot. But you having an empty solo cup, you are, you are the second place winner on the, in the mocktail. <laughs> mocktail guest contest and uh, and even though mount gay rum sponsors this we we approve we approve our mocktailers as well you know i, so, I was a big i was a big mount gay guy i just don't drink that much anymore yeah well you know solo sailing and drinking don't necessarily go no, that well together no. so we're gonna, we're gonna let you slide on that one but thank you but anyway thank you guys what a great audience too you guys ask a ton of questions and really good ones Jeff, if you wouldn't mind at some point once we hang up, if you could go through and maybe address a couple of those questions oh, that we didn't too. quite get to. And then we will definitely have you back on the program so we can we can get to those OMG scary sailing emergencies. And yeah. uh, obviously this is a popular topic. Let's just keep the conversation going. And uh, thank you guys. And um, have a great weekend, everybody. And we're going to let Sharb take over from here. Yeah. And Jeff, stick around in the green room. There's always a party in the green room. I hear you. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, Just one more thing. You guys want to come back next Friday because we have we have a fun topic. Next Friday is don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great time. We're not quite sure how it's going to go, but we have a feeling you guys might have some situations that we want to teach some people about how to not be a jerk. So yeah. we hope you'll join us next Friday on the Spinchy Happy Hour. Happy weekend, all. That's true. And it's a special two-hour episode because... <laughs> There's that many jerks out there, huh? Well, there's a lot to be talked about. Um, anyway, uh, well, that's awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Molly. I'm going to throw you guys in the green room real quick while I thank uh, our sponsor, obviously, uh, Mount Gabe Rum. Um, just say, uh, you know, hey, we can't do these things without them. And we can't do these things without you. So thanks for showing up. Um, tune in next week. How not to be a jerk. And, and bring some note, something to write down, you know, some uh, pa- paper and pencil. Um, with that being said, I hope you all uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>